Good day. I'm Elliot Stearns for La Jolla Christian Fellowship, and I welcome you to a meditation on the Monday of Passion Week, the Monday of Holy Week that leads to the Good Friday, in which Jesus was crucified, and the following Sunday, which Jesus is raised from the dead. Many events happened on the week and on the days previous to Good Friday, and I'm here to discuss Monday of that week. I call this message, The Hour is Come, a simple question and a countdown. Several times Jesus talked about the hour of his death. In John 12, John 13, and John 17, he said, The hour is come. For this cause I came to this hour. Jesus knew that his hour was come. And in John 17, he prayed to the Father, Father, the hour is come. What was that hour? And when did it begin? Well, we know that on Palm Sunday, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey and the crowds acclaimed him and he wept over Jerusalem seeing what was to come about. That evening he probably went back to Bethany and then on the Monday after Palm Sunday he came back into town and he cursed the fig tree and he cleansed the temple. But he also had a dialogue or a discussion or spoke to his disciples at this time on this Monday, which, which discussion is recorded in John chapter 12. And that's the subject of this particular meditation. And it is at least as important as the other events described in the Gospels. Now on Palm Sunday, the crowds acclaimed him, waved palm branches, strewed their garments on the, on the ground, but we read in John 12 that there was also a coterie or a group of citizens of Bethany who had beheld Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead and were in that crowd testifying of this. And the crowds were so excited. Can you imagine one man saying, I knew Lazarus, he was my neighbor, he was definitely dead and he was in the tomb for four days and Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And, and Lazarus came forth. There were many from the town talking about these things. The crowd was excited indeed. Boy, if Jesus was looking for acclamation, he had it that day. This was very worrisome to the Pharisees, however. They said amongst themselves, the Pharisees said amongst themselves, I'm reading from verse 19 of John 12, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing. Behold, the world has gone after him. Nothing they had done to stop this mad preacher from Galilee. Nothing they had done had succeeded. In fact, it looked like all their plans were failing. But Jesus obviously had another agenda than to win the acclaim of the people and take up the reins of government over Jerusalem. His design was not the Jews, but all the world. Birthed a new kingdom, birthed by repentance, acknowledging the gospel of salvation, forgiveness of sins, and living in a new creation in him. So the Pharisees said all the world has gone after him. In a sense, that was a prophecy. And in a sense, in fulfillment of that prophecy, the very next verse says, and there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came to Philip, which was of the site of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. We might add at the beginning of that verse, and speaking of the world, there were certain Greeks came to Jesus. The Greeks were of the world. They came to the feast. They wanted to see Jesus. The following verses read, Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus, and Jesus answered them. And he said, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Notice that Jesus did not directly answer 
the request of the Greeks and why I think will become clear. It was Philip and Andrew who were approached by the Greeks. They kind of stand between Jesus and them. What's interesting is that Philip and Andrew both have Greek names. Philip means lover of horses. Andrew means manlayer, man. And it is interesting that John adds that Philip came from Bethsaida of Galilee. Why would he throw that into the verse? Well, Bethsaida means house of fish. Did not the Lord tell Peter, you'll become a fisher of men? Therefore, the fish represent people of the world who are going to be netted by the gospel and brought into the kingdom of God. Moreover, Bethsaida is in Galilee. It says Bethsaida of Galilee, and Galilee is specifically identified in the book of Isaiah as Galilee of the nations and as a representative of the world. It's as if we're saying, Philip, you stand between me and the Gentiles. You stand as a representative of the power of the gospel going forth to the Gentiles and eventually through the Gentiles. We can see Philip and Andrew then as representative of the apostles or the messengers of God, the evangelists of God, proclaiming the gospel to the Gentiles. Philip, his name means lover of horses, representing that the gospel will go forth as swift as, as, on horse, as a horseman. And Andrew being manly, speaking of the men of God, the soldiers of Christ going forth in his name. It is an interesting reply that Jesus gives to Andrew and Philip once they approach him with the Greek's question. He doesn't say, well, bring them on. Let me, let me talk to them. He says, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Why did he say that? Well, he saw that the approach of those Gentiles was a sign sent to him from the Father. That the time had come to transition from the Jews, prepare the way for the gospel to go into all the world, represented by the Greeks. Once the Jews rejected Jesus, then the door was open to the world. Isaiah prophesied, speaking to the servant in that, in that book, representing Jesus, or was Jesus, I'm going to give you for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Isaiah 42 and Chapters 42 and 49. So the Greeks coming to Jesus showed Jesus that it was time for him to be glorified and that through his death on the cross, there would come in the forgiveness of sins and the reconciliation of all the world, those who would believe in his name. The following verse in John 12 is a little bit of a parable. Jesus explains what's going to happen. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, unless a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Therefore, the lesson is clear. Jesus would have to die on the cross in order to bring forth the resurrection fruit that would lead the multitudes of the world into, the, into salvation. So to the question of the Greeks, the reply Jesus gives is, yes, you can see Jesus. But you're going to have to wait for a little bit until the cross of Calvary is consummated and the resurrection takes place. And the pouring out of the Holy Spirit occurs in Jerusalem. And witnesses are formed to go into all the world, into Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. Jesus goes on to say, he that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. 
Ethos is about to introduce into this fallen world the kingdom of God in power and great glory following the resurrection. If a person is satisfied with their life in this world under the prince of this world with all of its violence and corruption and theft and death and suffering, then so be it. But if you hate your life in this world, if you hate this world under the dominion of Lucifer or Satan, then embrace the gospel. Take into yourself the death of Christ and live a new life and become a new creature with the love and the life of Christ within. It will demand a death to one's life in this world, to one's love of this world, to the desires of the flesh, but it will also lead to resurrection life, righteousness, peace, and joy in the kingdom of God here and now. Paul says, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in the body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in the mortal flesh. So we are to take up our cross. We are to renounce our life in this world in order to enjoy the resurrection life of Jesus Christ and to manifest it. The next verse in John 12 says, if any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there also will my servant be. Remember, he was at the right hand of the Father in the heavens. If any man serve me, him will my Father honor. honor. So to serve Jesus, to serve him is to follow him, and to follow him is to imitate him. As he laid down his life for us in love, so we are to lay down our lives for our brethren in love. And to have sweet fellowship by the Holy Spirit. And John promises fullness of joy in that fellowship. And the Father will honor the one who serves the Son in that capacity. I've often been convicted by the last words of that verse. He that serves the Son, him will the Father honor. Honor is not the same as love. It is God's love that's the basis for everything and the sweetest and most wonderful treasure that God can give us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But honor is reserved for esteem of character. As we receive the love of God, our hearts melt with that love. and We want to serve him, and we perform works, works of, of, that honor him, that glorify his name. We speak and we act in such a way that it imitates Christ and his love for us. If we do those things, then the Father will not only love us, he will honor us, he will esteem us, because we honor the Son, the Son of his love. We'll conclude with verses 27 and 28 of this chapter, though I do heartily recommend reading to the end of the chapter. Verse 27 says, as Jesus say, now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Jesus, at this point, having been given this sign and knowing that the countdown had begun to Calvary with the question that the Greeks brought, could in a sense begin to feel the first fruits of the pains that were to be his consummated on Calvary. He could feel the initial pangs of the jeers of the crowd, the thorns, the scourging, the nails. Now is my soul troubled, he says, because he knew it was a sure thing. It was what he was destined for, and it was inevitable. So he said, should I ask my father to save me from this hour? No, for this hour I came. And then he boldly, probably loudly, in the next verse, the first four words are, Father, glorify thy name. Jesus set his face like a flint without flinching. 
to go to Calvary for you and for me. And we're to imitate that as well. And may we pray during this holy week that as we perceive him walking with that determination to Calvary, we too might boldly take up our cross to follow him, to bear, bear that cross, to die to ourselves, that we might imitate him in his sacrifice for us. May the Heavenly Father grant us the grace to do those things. And thank you so much for listening, and the Lord bless you on your most holy week.